in the modern world, we can easily find ourselves in social situations in large cities, but you also know that that person walking by you on the sidewalk in that city may not have talked to anyone for a week, may be incredibly alone as they look down and away as you cross the crosswalk with them and you do the same. We're evolving these kind of social worlds in which it almost mocks us that we're more alone than we've ever been and yet living in these large social units called cities or connected to anyone around the world within minutes. And that's new. That did not exist before. And we are not biologically prepared for it. Okay, life can be crazy. You're feeling like you're sinking. Just trying to find a meaning. It's time for better thinking. Yeah, better thinking. Time to tune in. Let's go. This episode of Better Thinking Podcast is so dear to my heart. It's been a, you know, a dream of mine to spend time with Steve Hayes, the father of acceptance and commitment therapy. Uh, it's something I'm so wildly passionate about and it's been such a pleasure in this podcast to be able to pick his brain and, and try and appreciate where he sees you know, ACT going into the future and, and uh, also talk about his new book uh, coming out. A Liberated Mind. You're going to find out all about it in this episode. And uh, if you find it really, really uh, you know, fascinating, interesting, please share you know, with everyone. The more I can get sort of the ACT uh, message out there, you know, the, the more grateful I am. So you know, I'm just so, so excited about this episode. You'll probably notice I stutter a bit. You know, I'm nervous as hell. Um, that's what happens when you kind of meet your lifelong sort of, um, you know, uh, uh, mentor or, or, or you know someone that you look up to and, and have done so forever so um, enjoy extremely excited today I'm, I'm very nervous uh, and and that nervousness really comes from something that I've been waiting for 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 many years I must say um, and it comes from I suppose where my therapy has, has lied and, and, and lives and will continue to develop for, for many years to come, comes from this ACT world, which uh, has been you know, in some sense, well, in, in the real sense, fathered and, and raised and nurtured um, and promoted uh, in, in such a loving way as, as, as a father does with a child. Um, uh, and, and I think there's, there's this amazing sort of approach to how psychologists, therapists, people, humans can treat one another. Um, and these nerves come to me today in, in, in this episode because I'm introducing uh, Professor Steve Hayes or Dr. Steve Hayes, um, who really I've been look, looking up to for forever and a day and I still do. So I'm very nervous here on this end, uh, Steve, um, and welcome to the show. Well, I'm really glad to be here with you. And to talk about my work and to see if I can be of use to you and your listeners. Steve, uh, I, I really, there's, there's a million questions I'd, I'd like to ask. And I know that uh, my colleagues would be bombarding me. I can hear them in my ears at the moment. You know, can you ask this? Can you ask that? I thought today we could take an opportunity today to talk about your latest book that you're uh, releasing, A Liberated Mind. Um, and, and in some sense, how that's come to, to be released you know, now and, and in, in where the evolution um, has, has come to, to bring this bo uh, book forward. Because I know that your act work um, from its very early days has matured um, and moved and it's been, you know, that, that role of psychological flexibility that is a process-based, you know, space that's being moved forward. Um, maybe you can tell us a little bit about the up and coming book. Yeah, I'd love to do that. It's um, kind of a summary of the whole last 40 years in terms of the science story, personal story, and also a bit of a self-help book, really. But uh, by putting it all together, uh, I found myself saying some things that were, were pretty new but integrative. And so really it's a, a, a kind of the story of psychological flexibility as a concept, kind of how it got here where it plays, where it goes. And then uh, in the book, I try to show that basically it's relevant to everything 
that humans do. I mean, as I say, you know, uh, everywhere a human mind goes, these flexibility processes go. And there's a good reason for that. I think we're, we're really talking about how this evolutionarily recent adaptation that we're doing right now, the language and cognition, symbolic thinking, sits atop more ancient uh, biobehavioral systems in a way that creates opportunities and clashes, both. And uh, if we don't learn how to manage that, it manages us. And uh, so I think we're doing things in the modern world that are feeding inflexibility processes. We're paying the cost for it, literally, but uh, uh, beyond the financial cost, that's the cost in human misery and then a conflict between peoples and all of the things that we see on a television screen are fed by it. While at the very same time as a culture, we're yearning for a different way forward and we're seeking it out from our uh, therapists and self-help work and from uh, our mindfulness retreats and all of the things that are coming into the modern culture that I see as sort of attempts to create modern minds for the modern world that are, uh, our creative and um, intellectual abilities have created in the form of science and technology. We're challenging ourselves in ways that uh, uh, has never happened on the planet before. I mean, you can see her horrific things live happening just with the computer that you carry in your pocket. You can see comparison of the most incredible sorts. You want to look at gold-plated uh, doorknobs in some billionaire's bathroom, you can do it. Uh, you see the flow of judgment, of criticism, blame and shame, uh, and the tendency of people to sort of channel themselves into media streams that reflect just their own particular judgmental line of thought, sometimes in ways that are very unwise. and. Uh, repertoire narrowing and uh, objectifying and dehumanizing. And you put those processes together, you put together exposure to pain, exposure to judgment, exposure to comparison, raise that up, and you've got a formula for human misery. You, you, you just couldn't do worse. I mean, if you really were, uh, uh, you know, a diabolical creature and your intention was evil, you couldn't do worse than that combination. It's not I think intentionally worse, it's sort of side effect of what we've been doing in our cultural development. But now uh, time's up because if we can't learn how to rein in those processes and put the mind on a leash, learn how to show up inside your own history, knowing as you do, you're gonna be exposed to a lot of pain and horror in the modern world, a lot of fright that frankly your grandparents didn't have have to see unless they went to war or something really often and even then they came home and uh, uh if you know if we don't step up to that it, i think it's going to swallow us up so the book actually walks through that and uh, the exciting thing for me was just to see how it's developed but also to discover that there's some really new things that we can say about psychological flexibility that makes it I think uh, even more applicable to normal folks and to the therapy work that people do. You mentioned a lot about, uh, I suppose, establishing how difficult it is to live in this world. Yeah. Uh, uh, do you feel that it's a different world that we live in? I know that sort of modern uh, technology and you know life as it is today is, is very different than it was, you know, even a hundred years ago. Are we having more suffering now? Uh, or, uh, or is this suffering universal, whether it was 200 years ago, 1,000 years ago, or, or today? What, 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 what's your inclination? Well, I think the seeds of it are universal. But here's what we have now that we didn't have before. We're suffering amidst plenty. I mean, if you had to just pick a time to be born and you couldn't decide where on the planet, but you could decide when. You could not do better than choose right now. You couldn't. Because in every metric of human functioning, we're doing better except for our behavioral and mental health. And so you're gonna live longer. You're gonna be exposed to less violence. Disease will be less of a problem. You might say, oh no, violence, and no, no, slow it down, look at it. Violence has gone down. Oh, but there's so much stuff. No. Hunger is down, you know, poverty is down. Uh, so, and yet, 
you go to the developed and developing world alike, and you find that depression is up. Depression went from the fourth uh, cause, most frequent cause of uh, work-related disability, loss of, uh, uh, of uh, days at work, et cetera. How long ago? 20 years ago, the fourth. Now, number one. You look at our young people. You know, their anxiety, depression, stress is somewhere about a standard deviation higher than it was just 20 or 30 years ago. And you say, oh, that's just their, they're just complainers. They're just learning to say that. It's just self-report. No, dude, it's adolescent suicides. What are you talking about? This is not just self-report. These are people leaving by their own hand, especially among uh, uh, young girls. What the hell is going on? And something is going on such that we have this paradox of the modern world of suffering amidst plenty, pr pr prosperity on the one hand and misery on the other, right inside the very same individuals who are, yes, being fed and yes, have all these opportunities. And, you know, can, I mean, think about that computer in your pocket. I talked about the comparison uh, kind of issue. Yeah, but you can, in a matter of minutes, talk to almost anyone in the world. Think about that. This isn't 100 years ago or 50 years ago, like you were just saying. It was 10 years ago. Mm, mm. Whatever. What an amazing thing. What an amazing opportunity for communication, connection, cooperation, contribution. Well, is it actually functioning that way? Mm. I don't see it. I see our politics getting harsher. I see our social fabrics being strained. You know, we used to gather in small groups in the de developed uh, world, and we had all kinds of different ways we did it, whether it was within our church groups or in our uh, social societies of various sorts. My dad belonged to the Lions Club. I don't know if you know what the Lions Club is. Yes, yes, I do. But, you know, he was so looked forward to going there and hanging out with his buddies in the Lions Club. Nobody goes to those things anymore. Mm. I mean, they may still exist. I'm sorry if I'm hurting the feelings of somebody who belongs to the Lions Club or the Kiwanis or whatever it is. Church membership is down across the world, especially in the developed world. And you know, might say, well, who cares? You know, you know we've got science and all that. We don't have, no. Look at the data on something like your participation in social groups or your participation in faith communities. I've, done, I've looked at that uh, on how important that is to human beings to be able to step up to the challenges of death and disease and so forth. I mean, my colleague David Sloan Wilson wrote a really good book on the value of spiritual and religious traditions called Darwin's Cathedral. You know, David's an atheist, but he's walking into the data and saying, yeah, but the people who survived the plague, they belong to religious groups. Much, much higher. You just walk through it. You know, without our religious communities, we would not have evolved in the way we have. Now, I'm not here singing a song for, for um, religion qua religion. I'm just saying the way that we have evolved to function as human beings relied on social systems and on ways of being with each other, that the modern world is breaking down at light speed. And it's giving us opportunities like these computers in our pocket for connection, but we've not yet evolved uh, social ways and cultural ways of being together that is keeping up with the slicing and dicing that's going on by turning loose uh, exposure to pain, uh, judgment, and comparison. Uh, as my big three, there's others, but my big three uh, that uh, challenges not just the human mind, they have challenges, even non-human mind. Have you probably seen that great uh, little film clip from Franz de Waal where the monkeys are being fed with cucumber slices to work and then the monkey next door the gripe so is, uh, yeah. grapes. The next thing you know, he's throwing the cucumbers at the <laughs> just, You know, I'm not gonna eat your damn cucumbers. 
you know, and it's in the biblical stories, you know, the, the workers in the field and so forth. And this tendency for comparison to overwhelm us. So the things we have that may be perfectly adequate, you know, our, our little computer screen and our little music setup. And next thing you know, you're looking at the gold plated doorknobs and feeling like you don't have enough. You're looking at the Instagram posts of these wonderful outside lives of the people around you and inside you feel empty. Of course, you don't realize that you're seeing their outside life, not their inside life, and you compare your insides to their outsides. And but it's you know, I'm just giving little slices and examples of of the challenge that the modern world gives us. Now, Would I think true psychological to say? flexibility processes give us a partial answer to that, uh, and we have to find ways to put those into our hearts, minds, and homes. Is psychological flexibility more important now because of, in some sense, the comfort levels that we live in, that the, the um, you know, life has become, uh, and I say this sort of respectfully, but so easy, you know, so, so comfortable that it gives us the opportunity to go out and say, hey, that doorknob over there is a really nice doorknob. <laughs> You know, because I've actually got the time, I've got the privilege, uh, I've got the luxury to be able to do that now that previously I didn't, that, that the, we're wrestling with the mind more these days because of, of, of our context that we're in. That's an interesting take, and I think there actually is some truth to it. We can see it in what happens with development. Because uh, uh, the developing world has problems that they struggle with at a higher level. Uh, at, you know, an example is depression. I mean, indigenous uh, societies, poor societies, etc. depression isn't what people are struggling with. They're struggling with making sure they have enough resources to eat and so forth. And that uh, challenges so much, draws us forward. But it isn't just that. If you can flip it another way, take one of the things that it's inside a liberated mind as I started digging into what a what are we yearning for inside our inflexibility processes? Because it's my, always been my thought that inflexibility is kind of the wrong solution to the right question. And uh, the question that's inside it is, you know, how are you going to satisfy this? Well, the, this is the yearning. And it turns out that the flexibility processes are a real answer. The inflexibility processes are the the false gold answer. It's the smaller sooner over the larger later kind of answer. And if I can give you an example, I can link it back to the question that you were talking about. You know, I think if you had to pick one thing that's dominant about us just as a species, it's our yearning to belong. We're the social primates. We evolved in small bands and troops. We learned to cooperate. That's why we speak. That's why this very problem, this very uh, skill which is overwhelming us, symbolic language evolved, I believe, in the first place. But uh, that yearning to belong is critical to having even young children go through the process that will allow them to function well as part of a tribe or group or band. Well, in the modern world, as we slice up, slice up all these social groupings, and as we, our mobility, for example, allows families now to live anywhere. I mean, I've got four children, uh, ranging in age from 14 to almost 50. As I say, I've had children in the home for 55 years straight. By the time little Stevie goes to college, it sets a world record. Of course, you need multiple wives to do this, but we won't get into that. <laughs> it's not my fault. They, they throw me out. <clears throat> um, <laughs> yeah, but you know, I've got four children, but only one is living in my home. It's because it'd be illegal for him to move out. You know, the, the you know, one's in Colorado, one's in California, one's down in Los Angeles. So, you know, that's the modern world. We're used to it, aren't we? We're just kind of used to it. Well, what do you mean used to it? How new is that? You back up 200 years, that is not, that's happening. And for all the thousands of years that we evolved, that never happened. I mean, occasionally, you know, maybe the, 
you know, you join the other tribe or something. Or, or you get raided and you get pulled away and all those kind of things in these warring bands. But, but no, we evolved to live together in, in, in small bands and true. And, and so belonging, take this, that issue of belonging, which is so critical for us to be able to function. We yearn for it from birth, from birth. If you look at the eyes of a neonate, when your eyes locks with that brand newborn baby, the baby starts dumping endorphins. They come in biologically ready to sort of get addicted to the eyes that they're going to see through these natural opiates. And, and of course that would have evolved because it's so critical for that baby to follow the eyes of others and to see what they attend and to, to connect. And we even have eyes that allow that easily to be done. We have whites around our eyes. We're the only primates that do that and I'd have that. And so the baby can even see where mom and dad are looking from a distance. They don't just have to look at, as a gorilla baby might as to where mom and dad's head is turned. You can look where your eyes turn. The baby will look. So here's my, my, my point is, in the modern world, we can easily find ourselves in social situations in large cities ginormous of cities that, you know, that too evolved only in the last 100, 150 years. You'd have 50 million people in a city. I mean, these crazy, I went to Beijing, you know, you could drive for like hours and see nothing but roads and Mercedes. Incredible success going on there compared to what I saw with ox carts 30 years ago when I visited. But you also know that that person walking by you on the sidewalk in that city may not have talked to anyone for a week, may be incredibly alone as they look down and away as you cross the crosswalk with them and you do the same for, for you know, that little social convention, for fear that we might weird somebody out and actually look them in the eye when we walk by them at a crosswalk. You just watch what we do. We're evolving these kind of social worlds in which it almost mocks us that we're more alone than we've ever been, and yet living in these large social units called cities or connected to anyone around the world within minutes. And that's new. That did not exist before. And we are not biologically prepared for it. If you really want to crank up stress-related hormone outsend. You want to, you know, start getting epigenetic uh, regulation of uh, stress-related genes in a way that's going to shorten your lifespan. You want to pick the single thing that you could do that would do that fastest. Just create aloneness. Create alienation, disconnect, and aloneness. And you can do it not just physically, you can do it symbolically. You can be sitting in a crowded room and you can do it. And so... And that's uh, powerful, the fact that it can happen symbolically. 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 Isn't that crazy? And it, it harnesses, you know, I was looking at some of the underlying neurobiology of this. You know, that conceptualized self of, you know, I'm alone, I'm unlovable, nobody really wants me, that kind of thing that could be happening, even amidst people who are thinking the same things and yearning to talk to you, but you're not going to talk to them because we have this little social agreement that you don't freak each other out by saying hi even to strangers, etc. That whole kind of thing. What happens is there's actually neurobiological structures that start filtering out our sensory motor information that contradict that self-concept. And so you, you begin to biologically create a world that fits the conceptual world, that fits the socially uh, created sort of artificial world in which you're alone, even if you're in a, a crowded room. And so it's almost like these systems conspire against us to, to see what's possible. And so uh, the thing that I wanted to add to what you just said going back is it's and not just that kind of, there is a little piece there of, you know, we could afford to sort of make ourselves miserable in, you know, in the developed world. But the other part is, is that we really have lost something. If, if you go to a 
tribal, you, you go to Sierra Leone, let's see, and look at how they stepped up to the Ebola crisis. And man, everybody knows everybody in those villages. They're talking all the time. When you go home and you open your apartment door, wherever you go, you might not even know the name of the neighbor next door who's been there for four years. You know, that's different. And we didn't evolve for that. So as what I've discovered in writing A Liberated Mind is that really what we're doing with the flexibility processes is we're connecting ourselves up to deep yearnings. I'm, I know I'm on a bit of a long rant, excuse me for this, but the um, sense of belonging, for example, if we're not going to get belonging the easy way that you would have in a tribal society, we better do it by marshalling those kinds of consciousness that began when your mom looked in your eyes and said, you sweet baby, we better find the interconnection there between us in consciousness and connect with that so that when we do pull up our computers in our pocket, that we really feel as though we're connected to a human being and we're not interacting with a robot or a screen. And that's a little, that's part of what the mindfulness work does, is it helps us find this kind of uh, sense of consciousness that is inherently social uh, and goes across time, place, and person, this perspective-taking sense that allows you to take the perspective of another. Maybe in our conversation, for me to have a little bit of a guess as to what you might be feeling, as you might have a little bit of a guess as to what I might be feeling. And that does begin to heal some of the aloneness I think we've created with technology. Mm. How do you uh, address that uh, aloneness in, in a liberated mind? I, I know that uh, uh, a gentleman, um, Johan Hari, has spoken about uh, how we might go out and treat people with drug and alcohol addictions and, and in his research, looking at it, uh, bonding was the primary uh, feature of how we can treat these people rather than incarcerating them and uh, rejecting them from society and, you know, calling them, you know, addicts or junkies or whatever derogatory language that we can put on that. We, we rather act with love in, in, in some sense and compassion and bond, you know, we, we, we create bonding for them, meaning, purpose, um, you know, togetherness. How, how do you look at that in, 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 the, in, in, in your book and I suppose from your, your, your studies over the last 40 years, 40 years? Well, I'm trying to do two things, actually. And in the book, it talks about both. We can't just deal on the psychological side. We have to deal on the social side, too. And, and I think it, if we just deal on the psychological side, we tend to almost blame people if they feel connected. I think we have a, a tendency to look at things that are based on stigma, objectification, dehumanization of, of all the kinds of things that we put into the modern world through bigotry and, and bias, for example, and sort of say, tag, that's your responsibility to fix that psychologically, you the recipients of that. No, no, it isn't. It's our social responsibility. So don't forget the social context. But, but walking into a place where we can create those more positive social contexts requires also that we do the work within, that we do the psychological work. And so it's a one-two punch. So belonging, for example, I think is helped by uh, letting go of the conceptualized self and your attachment to it. Uh, it could be a negative concept, the one you just mentioned, I'm the addict. You know, it isn't just that people are throwing that at folks, people internalize that. And if you look at the internalization of stigma, it predicts long-term bad outcomes in the area of drug and alcohol. For example, what you just mentioned, the being on the receiving end of enacted stigma and then internalizing it as a toxic kind of process. So we want people to sort of let go of their attachment to the conceptualized self. But that includes on the positive end, you know, I'm the greatest of the great and the grandest of the grand. Nobody's better than me. Uh, you know, we see this on our television screens, too. We're seeing this incredible rise of narcissism and, and applauding it even, celebrating it as if it's a healthy thing, and it's not. Because inside, either I'm great 
or I'm the lowest of the low, in both cases, is fusion with a comparison. If you think about something that is uh, characteristic of you, like I'm smart, it doesn't take very much thinking to realize that you're also saying I'm smarter. Smarter than who, dude? Than all of you. Well, how connected are you going to feel with people when you're, when you're doing that? When, you're, when you know, your very self-identity is a comparison between you and how you concept, conceive of others. You can do it on the lower end. You know, I'm the worst of the worst, the lowest of the low, and it'll have a toxic effect too. So what's in the flexibility processes is letting go of the conceptualized self, good, bad, or indifferent. And instead, coming into this kind of witnessing and observing sense of self, these pr the part of the I hear nowness of awareness linked to this ongoing process of observing and describing your own experiences inside and out, that sense of self will allow you to go behind the eyes of another, to have compassion, as you mentioned, to be able to react emotionally when you take the perspective of another. And those are critical to being able to put things into the modern world, uh, you know, like empathy and connection. Uh, it, but it requires one more psychological flexibility skill. If you just do those two, and one of the things I worry about in the modern world, we can force that on you by the camera. You don't want to take the perspective of another. Here, I'll show you. I'll show you the tears of the mother as she sees the bloated body of her boy who fell out of the boat as they tried to escape Syria to a safer place. You can see the tears. I will force something that looks like empathy and looks like perspective taking with the camera. That's not enough because if you then don't run away when it's hard, you don't have the trifecta you need to be able to step into a non-judgmental and compassionate place of taking perspective, feeling what it feels like, and not running away when it's hard. So the flexibility processes that allow us to connect with others uh, of perspective taking, that kind of emotional reaction, but also you know, reigning in experiential avoidance. We have several studies now showing stigma, prejudice, objectification of others is predicted by those three things. If you can't take perspective, you don't feel what it feels like, or you run away when it's hard, you objectify and dehumanize people. We did a factor analysis of every possible bias measure we, you could think of, and inside that there's a thing called authoritarian distancing. It predicts whether you're you know, objectifying gays and lesbians or black people, or you are you know, have a religious bias, or you don't like people who are overweight, or you know, people have physical disabilities, or people have a drug problem. If you just go through all the gender bias, you go through all this kind of stuff, there's this core, and it's predicted by those three things. But here's another one that's kind of, kind of says how sad that is. It also predicts the inability to really enjoy being with other people. You only enjoy people if you can take their perspective, feel what it feels like, and not run away when it's hard. And so social anhedonia, you know, I don't feel anything about people, which is right inside this modern version of aloneness, of just, you know, we get numb almost, seeing all this pain and so forth. So uh, what I would say is to create that kind of bonding that's real, that hits you emotionally, we have to work on these kind of mindfulness skills of being able to take perspective and, and to, uh, feel emotionally what it's like. But also these uh, processes of emotional openness. And if you leave any of that on the floor, uh, well, you, just, you could predict what we see on our television screens. There's a rise of objectification and dehumanization. It's right on their television screen. Uh, whether it's towards immigrants or people who are different or whatever it is. And at the same time, these social connection processes are not being enhanced. And I think people feel more alone. So uh, I want to one, one, I'm sorry for the length of the answer, but the one thing I also want to say in a liberated mind we walk through how you could take these flexibility processes and then link them to the active creation of pro-social groups. And I'm working with uh, my colleague, David Sloan Wilson, and who's an evolutionary biologist, and 
some other psychologists around the world, Paul Atkins, particularly at Australian a Catholic University, to put uh, Eleanor Ostrom's Nobel Prize winning design principles for how pro-social groups managed their forests and lakes and rivers and streams and putting them into, well, into clinics and your business and your church group and your bowling team and your uh, family and uh, whatever it is that you are part of as a pro-social group. It, it turns out that we can take these flexibility processes and marry them up with uh, the processes that uh, evolution itself has established as how you get bond cooperative groups that are bonded and know how to work together. So I'm trying to work on both sides of that fence psychologically, but then also actually changing the social environment. I'm hearing that through having that flexibility of uh, separating oneself from the conceptualized self, you know, the self story, we bond more. You know, we, we, we're, we're less judgmental of not only ourselves, but others. And through that comes a greater capacity to be able to look at pro-social, um, you know, behaviors. Uh, it, it's all kind of tied in, 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 in one. It's, it's one organism rather than separate uh, processes. That's exactly right. Exactly right. And I do think we need to think about this when you, the, when you say one organism, you know, we're, there's a kind of a multi-level evolutionary perspective here. You know, the group is a real entity. We're, we're so social. We're uh, almost, you know, the joke goes that we're 10% uh, chimp and 80% bee. <laughs> you know, we're really more in some ways like the social insects. And, and when we appreciate that and we can bring science behavioral science and evolutionary science to that. Now we can work on how to use those principles to design our psychological and our social space. And that's never been tried on the planet before. We're using our science and technology to put computers in our pocket or, you know, maybe have drones land you your Amazon package on the porch, which is all great. But how about, how to help us design new ways of uh, organizing pro-social groups and helping us psychologically to engage with them. That's possible. We can do that. And uh, I don't want to, you know, chest thump about it. It's not like we have the answer. No, we have the question and we have some answers and they're good enough to win Nobels. So they're not like dumb answers. They may not be, you know, the, the perfect, final answer but uh, so these as we get in more into processes and this is one thing i'm really proud about if excuse me for uh, if you allowed a little bit of pride that about the uh, act work is that because we focus so much on processes these flexibility processes we can kind of put that knowledge out there for people to use in different ways it doesn't have to be like act uber all us, you know, that everybody needs to be going and seeing an act therapist or something. It's nothing like that. These processes are right in this very moment between you and I. And so are these social, pro-social and cooperation processes. So wouldn't it be cool if we could take Western science and dig into the things that are, have to do with our wisdom traditions and our culture traditions and find the parts of that that really are wise, but maybe be able to squeeze them down to the smaller set, you know, the 20% that does the 80% and, and put those into human culture uh, and the end of the human uh, mind and heart deliberately. We do that through therapy because people are so miser miserable they ask for it, but we could do it in other ways. I mean, companies can ask for it. Churches can ask for it. Schools can ask for it. Cities can ask for it. Governments can ask for it. I mean, why, when the people are thinking about development, do they turn only to the physical scientists and not the behavioral scientists? Why is that? It doesn't make sense because no amount of physical science is going to solve these problems that we've got alone. You know, you pick anyone, global warming, and you can have the most, uh, you know, ecologically sensible car and you can still you know, drive it enough miles, for example, that it's, or build it in a way, or not do other things such that we're going to have a global warming anyway. I mean, it's going to have to be worked out. 
uh, with the behavioral scientists at the table. And um, uh, I, I hope we're on a trajectory where that becomes uh, a more normal thought for uh, business, uh, government, industry, et cetera. If you were at the table, yeah. and you had that opportunity to, to offer you know, uh, one or two ideas from a societal yeah. level, what are the sorts of things that you would offer as, uh, you know, uh, talking point points, you know, uh, the start of that conversation? Well, if you take something difficult like global warming, you know, something like that, that's a really, look, doesn't look like a behavioral problem. Uh, yeah, it is actually. And the very first book I ever wrote, I've written 46 of them or how many, something like that. Um, the very first book I ever wrote was called Environmental Problems, Behavioral Solutions, where I, I walked through the data on how to bring psychology into getting people to behave in ways that would deflect the trajectory that we were on. You know, and that was an interest of mine in the 70s. I've been an environmental activist and I was a, you know, an organizer and so forth before I became a psychologist. And so it was natural for me, it was my first um, book in the 70s to, to write about that. Well, but it, you know, it just sort of sat there. It just sat there. There's a few things that were used. Actually, that was the, you know, that thing you get in your little monthly bill where it says uh, your energy use this month compared to last year of the same month. I was the first person to study that and publish a piece on that. So I had an early involvement in these kind of issues, but we kind of then just didn't know how to complete the deal. If, if I were uh, at the table, I would say, okay, let's see, how can we bring a values conversation into these issues? And how can we empower small groups to find a way to work together to promote these issues and put policies in, in place that are psychologically wise and socially wise and that you know, allow this kind of bottom-up uh, participation of individuals with their caring into the correction uh, of this worldwide technological uh, uh, problem. And I, I think, you know, we already see that. We see that in people, you know, the greening of uh, our communities with some people doing very creative social things to try to help do that, but almost in a way that's actively disempowered, where, you know, power is almost try to make sure that can't happen and that you can't form collectives, let's say, that would allow you to share the solar energy you produce in ways that would maybe, yeah, undermine somebody's short-term economic interest, but foster our ability to, to work together and to help our communities. So um, uh, I couldn't give you a turnkey solution, a one-size-fits-all solution, but I could say we have science that is there that will help us use the basic learning principles and principles in terms of how symbolic learning works to, to get our behavior motivated by the right processes and to turn it loose inside of social processes that could really make a difference. You know, the problem there, it gets me a little bit off script to do this, but the problem really is this, is that we've organized our thoughts about economic systems around a false vision of human beings and whether you do it from the left with the command and control economies, or if you do it from the right, from bottom up, greed is good, invisible hand, both of those things are lies. They're false. This is why Lynn Ostrom won the Nobel Prize in economics. Because the economists know there has to be another way than these two failed approaches. Both of them are miserable failures. You can just look around and see it. Nobody wants a command and control kind of uh, economics and nobody wants greed is good economics. Well, what's the alternative? It's something that's in this space of this evolutionary uh, cooperative uh, small group, but also I think psychologically connected and flexible space. And that's why, you know, we're working to put together what Lynn uh, uh, I, I met her, I, I, I guess I can call her Lynn, and spent a few days with her, she's dead now, but what Lynn won the Nobel for uh, with 
these flexibility processes. So uh, I guess that doesn't give you a turnkey solution, but it gives you a way forward. Fi let's find the middle path that is built on a real psychology. And the real psychology is, is that we want, we yearn to do good. We yearn to cooperate. And yes, we will become selfish if you create a social environment in which you can't safely cooperate, or if you feed psychological processes that just through our symbolic processes make us feel as though the only way to self-soothe is through self-aggrandizement. Uh, you feed those and you'll get a lot of bad behavior, but it's not what we came here to do. Most of the things we call moral and ethical are part of our evolutionary history of learning how to cooperate together and, and to love each other and to take care of each other. And you can do that and not just by singing Kumbaya, but by getting the things out of the way that interfere with these natural motivational tendencies. Your book is titled uh, A Liberated Mind. In some sense, I'm hearing that as a collective mind that uh it, it 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 goes beyond you or i and 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 broadens out to uh, us boy that is so true it, it's just absolutely true i mean that's the kind of monkey we are it just is the kind of monkey we are. and you know the first paper i ever wrote on act was in 1984 it was called making sense of spirituality and in there, I kind of ar argued what later would lead to relational frame theory and, and to act. Uh, but this was after, uh, uh, because it began to rain in mountain panic disorder and so forth. But what was inside that was the idea that, uh, you know, these spiritual experiences are built on the symbolic source of human consciousness. And human consciousness is social. It's, you know, babies who are... Uh, raised uh, as uh, feral children or, or put in closets, there are children who who do never get a social exposure through various means, sometimes through very disturbed parents or whatever, you know, and they don't develop human language. They don't develop normal human consciousness. But human consciousness is not alone and in the corner. It's connected. It isn't just I, it's I, you, and it isn't just here, it's here, there, and it isn't just now, it's now, then. You can imagine what it's, be, what it's like to be in that boat of Syrian refugees trying to escape violence. You can imagine that. You can take your consciousness and put it in a war zone. You can go forward and say, you know, it was 114 degrees in, in France. It's going to be 116 it's going to be 118. Are my grandchildren going to be able to live? I mean, you can put your consciousness in the minds of, or in imagination of children who are yet unborn, yeah? And wonder, what kind of a world are we creating here? What are we going to leave for our children's children? Our children's children's children. And I think our capacity to do that really is who we are. It's why we succeeded. It's why we go everywhere. And, you know, from all across the planet and imagining how we can go into outer space and stuff, we're using the fruits of thousands of years of cultural and psychological development. But it's all built on this social monkey called human beings. So I, I've written a paper arguing that even a single word, just having a word for something is a social act. Because it's only, I argued, because cooperation came first, that we would have evolved symbolic learning. Because the core of it is the bidirectionality of an object gets a name, then I say the name, you orient towards the object. 12-month-old babies will do that. Six-month-old babies won't. Yeah, but if you go into a a six-month-old baby will understand intentionality even before then. And the way I de demonstrate this in, in workshops is I hold up an object, I ask somebody to make a sound, and they do, and then I hold it up again, and I make that sound as if we just gave it a name. And then I give the object to someone in the audience, and I make the sound. And they look at me, and universally what they do is they give me back the object. 
we're the only species on the planet who does that word uh, having an object with a name you say the name you get the object we're the only species that that is that the language trained chimp so-called don't do it i mean sherman and lana the pride of the atlanta troops of the sue savage rumba duane rumba's troops don't show symmetry that's symmetry in a thing called stimulus equivalence and if you don't develop that you never develop human language so my point being even what we call our minds like what you and i are doing together right now the essence of that is social it wouldn't have even started without social uh, processes of being able to take the role of us as a listener and understand if i say a name for example maybe i want the object and to provide it for me that probably happened in troops of human beings or hominids depending on where you hominids depending on where you uh, draw the line even before we, we developed it out into normal symbolic language we probably started with at least some sort of sign object object sign symmetry it's the simplest relation it emerges earliest in children and i think it probably emerged earliest in human culture but what drives it is the cooperative nature of us as human beings so that's how basic it is it's uh, we're we're uh, social to the core if you were the last person on the planet and everybody else was gone you'd still be thinking about oh i wish she was here to see it or maybe i'll write it down and someone later on will find it or i mean you will be living in a social world that's in your head mm. even if it is completely removed from existence is that symbolic uh, uh understanding in some sense tamed by being socially connected that the more bonding i have the more references i will experience or gain from others to help me untangle from that symbolism is that is that a potential uh, uh hypothesis that that people who are you know connected bonded fare better uh, because other people are able to in some sense give them those perspectives or new reference points or, or, or guidance or model new symbols uh, for whether it be you know, uh, for, for the language or for their own language in their mind. You know, there's some data that would support that. It's an interesting and uh, creative idea. Um, and I, you know, the, the, uh, we do know that the kind of uh, social support, for example, helps us a little bit with, uh, fusion processes with these kind of excesses. Um, I mean, one of the ironies of talking the way I was just talking is that if symbolic language started as a form of cooperation, it soon enough became a form of problem solving, which is also socially useful. But then it also became a story, uh, uh, you know, a, a way of uh, telling stories, but also of conceptualizing yourself, but also conceptualizing others of, and you know, there we are, we're off to the races. So, yes. So it's one of these maybe unintended effects of an evolutionary process that initially had a bonding of cooperation purpose as the primary driver. And that's probably why it spread throughout so quickly throughout the human uh, community. But it then moved in a different direction, which has created this kind of evolutionary mismatch where, uh, you know, we live inside our heads. We walk across, we walk through the busy streets of our cities feeling alone. We objectify and dehumanize uh, uh, others using the very instruments that our minds created to allow us to see their experiences. So uh, what that tells me is, um, yeah, let's go back to basics, like those social values you're talking about, kind of uh, put our feet to the ground. Uh, you know, the word humble means dirt. You know, you put your feet in the ground, you know, get a little more humble and maybe a little less self-aggrandizing, a little less con connected to your, your stories and a little more interested in connecting to other people and, and to their experiences which is, uh, uh, you know, I, I think a, a lot of the work that we do inside ACT and the acceptance and mindfulness work is focused on 
going beyond the analytical judgmental mode of mind to issues of felt sense, emotions, bodily sense, mindful awareness, but also into issues of social connection, participation, values, community. I mean, almost all of our values, if you really work on somebody and you have them sort of picking their, you know, what brings meaning and purpose into their life just autonomously, they have to do with other people. I mean, even if it looks very sort of, you know, like I just want to create something beautiful, yeah? But then I want to share it with other people. I mean, it's, everything is social. So uh, I think you make a very good point. You can work back from that and probably our social support and social connections help humble us and put a feet in the ground and maybe put a little leash on this uh, judgmental mind of ours. I suppose uh, in in liberating others, we can also liberate ourselves through through that that learning that uh, you know those around us have to be fairly skilled um, or. Uh, mindful, present, uh, conscious, deliberate in what they're thinking to be able to ground us too. That is true. And there's a kind of a social propagation that, I, I, you know, that's implied in that of these are dual-headed arrows. And to me, that's a hopeful thought that, you know, this dialectic between the psychological and the social means that, for example, if we can move people through these mindfulness processes that has a social propagation effect but it also then operates back on yourself and others and we can uh, maybe uh, soften the excesses of uh, human culture and you know bring things into the world that are supportive of uh, positive psychological processes from the social side and vice versa the kind of a self-amplifying process. We've seen it go in a self-amplifying way. We started our conversation with that in the wrong direction. Can we design it so it goes in a self-amplifying way in the right direction? I think we can. I think we are. And I've actually, I'm pretty hopeful, that even without the scientists, cultural evolution is pretty powerful. People will figure out a way forward. But let's do it more quickly. Uh, you know, we don't have to learn only through the pain of, uh, you know, Florida going underwater or something. I mean, let's be a little more wise and get some of these processes uh, into into human culture quicker. Steve, what's your hope for this 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 book in particular? Well, what I really hope is that a, a psychological flexibility will enter into the cultural conversation. You know, mindfulness clearly has. And that's great. And that's part of the psychological flexibility story. Now, values has actually a values-driven life, purpose-driven life. You know, people are sort of yearning for that. That's come in. But the psychological flexibility concept tells you there's several things that fit together. They're aspects of the same thing. The data sort of show that. And by understanding that, uh, I'm hopeful that just normal people in the work that they do or in what they're doing with their family or with their own mental health issues or whatever, but also policymakers and people who are responsible for businesses and all the, the different kind of human communities and stuff out there. We'll start thinking about these uh, concepts. It hasn't, you know, we've had bad, good kind of cultural breakout moments with uh, some uh, uh, of the ACT work and psychological flexibility work entering in you know, uh, get out of your mind into your life, went to number 20 on Amazon, beat Harry Potter for one glorious week. <laughs> That's why my wife reminds me only one week. And I say, dear, but doesn't my bank account know that? But, uh, <laughs> but, uh, but, you know, we've had people when they've seen it, sometimes things have, oh, okay, I see something in there. What I hope for this book is that it's serious enough and broad enough. I mean, we're sitting on... 3,400 studies now, 300 randomized trials of ACT, about three or 400 studies on a relational frame theory, about 1,000 studies on psychological flexibility processes in a specific way. I mean, it is an enormous database now, and it's, you know, we're getting a new randomized trial every five days. We're getting a, a new study on psychological flexibility or its aspects a couple every single day. 
So uh, I'm sorry if that sounds grand and glorious. I didn't mean it. I'm just that way. I, I meant like we know a lot. Not everything, but we know a lot. And it isn't a simple story. It isn't even like some of these processes. There are times where inflexibility is helpful. We know that now. There are times when you fusion is probably helpful, when experience avoidance is helpful. But so it's not kind of decontextualized, you know, just, you know, do this only and life will be great. Now, there's many other things to do and everything has a time and a place. Uh, sort of it's a yin yang thing. You know, there's that little spot of the dark inside the light and the light inside the dark. Remind yourself, it's not never 100%. Nothing's ever like that. But um, I'm hopeful that um, when people back up and they look at this, that they'll sort of go, by golly, this is important everywhere. At the, the state, the last part of the book I walk through, you know, yeah, mental health and depression, anxiety, stuff like that. But then I walk through diet and exercise or social connections or sport and recreation and organizations running your business. You know, you, you get to the point where uh, you just can say, this is of importance. I mean, I was in Rio and watched people win gold medals doing act. That's cool. Uh, you know, there's CEOs of ginormous organizations running them using act processes. That's cool. And um, I don't want to sort of put a period on the end of that and say, that's cool, we've done our work. No, that's cool as kind of a sign or a pointing finger forward. And uh, if people do uh, get a liberated mind and they know anything about ACT, they're going to see a whole lot of new stuff there because uh, we've been trying to link this up now to these underlying human yearnings, what that means, to really making these process reads. And uh, it, it changes how you think about it. If I could just give an example. If you know something about ACT, you probably think like, boy, the really bottom line is values-based action. And I'd say, yeah, that's right. That's the bottom line. But don't forget also that we are the creatures for whom a yearning to be competent is characteristic of it, not just a yearning to have self-directed meaning. A yearning to feel is part of it. A yearning to understand, to be oriented, to know where you are, to be able to, to uh, 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 belong. And so what's in a liberated mind is some new material on how these core motivations of human beings are involved both in the inflexibility processes, they're sort of human yearnings mishandled, almost always because of the evolutionary mismatch between the problem-solving mind and the other parts of us, and these flexibility processes when you learn how to put the mind on a leash and refocus on what you're trying to accomplish. So. Um, uh, I'm hopeful that it'll also broaden the vision of the community of folks who are interested in acceptance and mindfulness-based therapies and how they might play in the world, but also uh, increase the connection across some schools of thought that uh, get us all on the same page and get us a little more less interested in our schools and our labels and uh, you know, this therapy or that and that protocol or that and more in the processes that liberate people and how we can uh, focus on them and get them into human lives. So uh, it's a kind of a call to arms, but also a, an ex extending a hand to uh, uh, different parts of the human community that uh, have knowledge and are working on these uh, kinds of issues to say, there's something in here that would help you. Uh, that would empower you, that could combine with what you're doing. You don't have to stop what you care about. You can add this and uh, accelerate human progress. That's what I hope people see. Well, I'm certainly looking forward to uh, leaning into uh, this new book uh, and, and, and finding out more of, I think what you're describing is a, a uh, another perspective, a nuanced perspective about uh, how to bring these processes in, in not only for ourselves, but uh, us, you know, the community 
um, uh, looking at it with with I suppose new eyes, so to speak. Um, you know, trying trying to see greater greater depth. Uh, how how are people able to find you know uh, get a hand uh, get get their hands on uh, a liberated mind? Well, it's already up on Amazon. I, I know it's not the only bookseller there, and it's crushing all of the uh, small bookstores, but it's available basically uh, almost anywhere around the world. There's a number of translations, there's already 18 that are under translation. The only one that will be released at the very same time, August 27th, I believe is the one in the UK. Uh, but um, so uh, in the US and UK at the end of August, it'll be available in bookstores and uh, through all of your various online uh, retailers and around the world. Um, most of the major uh, languages within a year or so will have a translation. Fantastic. And oh, on, on your website too? Uh, you can certainly find the link on the website. And, uh, you know, if people want a quick uh, little uh, introduction to ACT and want to go to my website, stephenchays.com, I'll send them out through an autoresponder, a little seven item, one at a time. And I don't spam people, but I do reach out to them. I send out little newsletters and things like that. So that if you go there, uh, you don't have to give up your email address. But if you do, then um, I can send you those things and stay in communication with you. That's stephenchays.com. Exactly. Lovely. Stephen, I, uh, I, I don't know how to thank you enough, uh, not only for the work that you've done to, to date and, you know, in terms of this ongoing work, I can't wait to get my hands on, on this because I, I really do feel inspired uh, speaking with you and, and um, you know, you really do live and breathe, you know, what, what you've uh, offered as, as an idea to, to the world, not only you and, and, and your colleagues, I think, uh, there's a lot of people who have done incredible you know, work and continue to do it as a, as a collective, you know, and I think there's more and more people coming together, um, you know, from that first seed. Uh, that's probably, you know, in some sense, a distant uh, a memory, but, uh, you know, also so you know, profound in where it's come with all the research that, that you've described. Um, so really, really appreciate you taking the time i know that you've got family obligations to to attend to and and you know you, you, you your your values you know have, um you know you're 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 balancing those as as we speak so you know when you say those processes are always happening um they certainly are so thank you very much for your time well thank you for the opportunity and uh i look forward to uh, uh you know supporting your work again in the future and uh, Hope that uh, it's useful to those who, who uh, were listening. Absolutely. And I'm, I'm sure we'll uh, reach out again at a later date to uh, have you on for maybe another further examination of, you know, the act space. Take care. Cheers. 